So today we wrap up uh, the, the series on prayer, okay? As we, so inside your program is an outline. I want to encourage you to pull it out. Mountain Moving Prayer. And so we wrap up the series, and we're going to go back to the, the series that or the, the scripture that we use for the theme, and we're going to look at it in a different gospel, but nonetheless, we're going to take a look at it and understand it, all right? So have you ever done, raise your hands if you've ever done a trust fall, Anybody ever, ever do a trust fall? All right. So a trust fall is like companies do it for like building uh, teams. It's like building team, building community, and all this other stuff. Well, you know, my mind's a little bit wacky. And so I'm thinking, how can we do it on the stage where it would be funny? And then um, I'm thinking, ah, I got the, I got the perfect idea. So here was the, I, I was going to magically select somebody that I was going to, you know, have a trust fall, get two of the biggest guys in the, in the church to stand and say, just trust us, and whether I was, eyes were closed, and this is what I'm, I'm thinking, right? I'm like, we're going to pull the lid off the baptistry. <laughs> You're liking it already, aren't you? Right? And then, and then right when we're going to go, go ahead and fall, and then they're going to go, psych, and the guy, you know, the person's going to go fall. And so I'm all excited about it, and I come out, and I'm like, oh, the choir's singing. Ah. Oh. <laughs> That dreaded choir, they ruin all the fun, right? And so uh, it, it's always fun to do. Here's a cute little video of someone who may not have got the right directions of a trust fall. Close your eyes and just fall down, okay? Okay, then Lauren's going to catch you. Close your eyes? Okay. Okay, it's called the trust fall. Can we turn okay, the lights down? Fall. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Memo, missed. <laughs> fall back, little girl, fall back. <laughs> All right, so anyway, we're going to put it off till next year when the choir risers aren't there, and we're going to figure out another way to do a trust fall, right? <clears throat> so, so here's how I think prayer goes, and I think that's kind of a cute way of doing it. I think prayer is a trust fall. We're going to trust our situation, our life, our situation to, to God, and we're going to fall back. But some of us feel a little bit apprehensive about doing that, right? And then for some, maybe you feel like you've, you've, you fell back and he didn't catch you because what you wanted didn't happen. And you thought it was going to be and it wasn't. And so like, can I trust him to fall? Can I, can I really like place all my situations and my circumstances into his hand and how does that work, right? And we struggle with that. And the Mountain Moving Prayer series was really a challenge to pray for big prayers, right? To encourage each other, to lift each other up, to pray that God can move mountains in our life. And so we looked at Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, the very top of your outline. <clears throat> this is the theme, the, the scripture theme through the week, it's a, through the series. It says this, he replied, so Jesus replied to the disciples, the disciples wanted, uh, were unable to heal a, 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 young, a young boy who was demon-possessed, possessed, and they're kind of questioning. They're not really sure what's going on. And so Jesus comes to them, and he replies to their question, like, how come we can't do it? And he says, because you have so little faith. And he says, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And it will move. Nothing is impossible for you. Right? And, it, and it, it is, when you read the Gospels, it is a rebuke to the disciples, but I think it's encouragement to us. Because he says that if you have faith just the size of a mustard seed, right? If that's all you can, all pun intended, muster up. <laughs> Bing ding shh. I'm here all week, folks. You guys are pretty quick. Part of the brains are thawed, part of the brains are asleep, right? So anyway, that's all good. So he, if we can just muster up just that little bit of faith, the scripture says that you could move mountains, right? Which again, I, I find it encouraging to do. And so through the series, we've encouraged you folks to fast. Did anybody make it, anybody make it through the 21 days of fast? Did you do it? Yes, I have my donut today. <laughs> She, she's going to have her donut today. That's awesome. 
<laughs> Any, anybody else? 21 days, I know some of you did like a week long with just this uh, juice and stuff. I, I did most of it. I missed like two days of the 21 days where I had some uh, dinner issues going on. But, but the goal was to really press us to trust God. And so we heard some great stories. Many of you shared with me that your prayer life enhanced, that you really felt passionate about really believing God for big things. And so it was kind of cool things to hear. But, but here's what I want to talk about today. When it comes to believing that God can move mountains, there's always an issue with doubt. Would you agree with that? Have you ever done this? How it works for me. See if you relate. It's like, you know, I read the scripture, I begin to pray, and I, I, you know, visualize God as this giant, powerful, almighty, all things are possible God, and I'm full of confidence that God could do literally anything. And then I start praying, oh, Lord, And then all of a sudden, doubt becomes in. Can he really? I mean, do you think he'll do it for you? Are you sure? I mean, what if he doesn't? What if he isn't listening? Right? And then my brain is just inundated with doubt in my life. And then I like regroup. It's like, I'm at like word four of my prayer, right? It's like, okay, Lord, You created the heavens, you created the earth, you created everything. Oh, God. (laughs) Little G, God. And doubt begins to kick in, right? And I struggle with it. And it's like, how, how is it possible? And then you go through this whole guilt thing about belief and doubt, and, and people will call me and say, you know, Dan, I believe in God, I think, but I'm filled with doubt, and therefore, maybe my decision to invite Christ in my life or my walk with him really isn't real. It's like, well, wait a minute. Belief and doubt are not polar opposite. Belief and unbelief are, but not doubt, right? Doubt is just a weak faith in trusting him. And we wrestle with it because we want to see God do a great thing, and then we struggle with it. And what's interesting about it is those who muster up, all pun intended, enough enough courage to call me, you know what I tell them? Man, you're not alone. I mean, on a monthly basis, I hear people say, but I'm not really, right? I got doubt, and I'm struggling with it. And, and, And so when we doubt, it's not the unforgivable sin nor is it uncommon. In fact, all through Scripture, we find individuals who had moments in their life where they doubted. So we're going to look at a different gospel account of the same story. If you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 9. Jesus has just had a mountaintop experience That's where the heavens open up and and, and a voice from heaven says, this is my son who I'm well pleased. Pay attention to him and listen to him and do what he tells you to do. You know, that part of the transfiguration that takes place. So they come down from the hill. There's a group of people who are following along and the disciples are all there. And so that's where we pick up in verse 15. So as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and they ran to greet him. What are you arguing about with them, he asked. And a man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a, uh, by a spirit that, ha- uh, that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him on the ground. He foams uh, at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. <clears throat> There's a joke here. Can I have a little joke? I think I seen that kid at Target the other day. Just kidding. All right. I asked, I, I asked your disciples to drive out the Spirit. And let's read the last four words together. Okay? But they could not. I mean, the desperation. Imagine your child, right? It has this demon possession that's taking place. And he's robbed of a speech. He falls down. And he says, terrible thing. And this father comes And he's already tried the disciples, and the disciples couldn't do it. They were not able to do it. And so he has this little bit of faith moment where he's going to believe that Jesus can. 
And so he steps out, and verse 19 goes on. And Jesus says to them, Oh, un, uh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? Because, he's, again, he's anticipating his, his uh, crucifixion and resurrection. And so he's asking, how long should I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? And he's not mad at him. He's frustrated. And it, maybe you've had a situation where you've had somebody that you really love and they're making poor choices or they're not getting it. And you keep having a conversation with them, and it's like, yeah, 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 I got it, yeah, 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 I got it. And then they continue to make the poor choices, and you're like, when are they going to get it? You're not mad, you're frustrated, right? And so this is where Jesus is at. He's frustrated with, with the group of people because they're, they're not getting it. And so he goes on in verse 19, and he says, bring the boy to me. So this father is going to bring his mountain to the mountain mover. But at this moment, he doesn't believe that Jesus can do it. It's really a last-ditch effort. It's kind of like just kind of thrown and hoping for the best. So he brought him to him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, he immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell on the ground and rolled and foamed at the mouth. And you got to imagine, the father at this point, he's like, you know what, I'm just going to go home. I'm just going to take my kid because it's getting worse, right? Which I said last week. Oftentimes when we pray about something, it gets worse before it gets better. And, and so I'm just going to take my kid and I'm just going to go home. Let's just call it good. I mean, I'll just deal with it and we'll just do the best, the best that we can. Verse 21. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has, it been, how long has he been like this? Now, do you think Jesus didn't know? Of course he knew. He knew exactly what was going on in the kid's life. But I actually think that this question is asked by, to the father because Jesus recognizes that doubt is creeping in. In fact, he's full of doubt. His faith is so small, it's almost probably not even in existence. And so Jesus' question isn't about he doesn't know. It's really about having this, this, this man come to terms with what's taking place inside of him. We don't know the age of the kid. We don't know how long he's, he, was, he was ill or you know, whether he's a high schooler or what, what the case is, but we know that it's, he's, he's not doing so well. <clears throat> Verse 22. But when, uh, uh, so, so he, asked the, he asked the father, he's had it since childhood, he, so, go, he says, and then <clears throat> he goes on and he says, but if you can do anything, have you ever felt that way? I mean, God, I don't know. <laughs> you spoke everything into existence. You created everything. I mean, Pastor Dan says you have power over illnesses and relationships, problem, blah, 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 blah. And, 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 you, and you begin to pray, and it's like you're full of confidence and four words into your prayer. Your mind gets to the point where, God, if you could just do like anything, I would be grateful. And so he says, yeah, if you could do anything, <clears throat> that would be awesome. Take pity on us, he says. Verse 23, Jesus answers and he says, if you can? I mean, you're, you're, you're talking to the mountain mover and you're asking me, if you can? And then Jesus says, Everything is possible for him who believes. In the Greek, the next phrase that the, the guy calls out, is, it's almost like a shout. I believe! Right? Then there's a pause. Because now he is catching up with what he just spoke. Right? You ever done that? You ever speak something and then all of a sudden your mind catches up with what you said? Yeah, some of you agreed to go to a party sometime this week, right? And you said, oh, yeah, I'm going to go. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, no, what am I going to do now? You, sure, right? We, we've all spoke. And then all of a sudden we have to pause and we have to take in what we just said. And the father's like, I believe. Ooh. And then look what he says. Help me overcome 
my unbelief. So there are two miracles in this story. Okay, two miracles in this story. Number one, the first miracle is the father's son was healed. Okay? And that's the story that everyone talks about when you read the passage that, the, that Jesus has cast out the demon, he grabs the boy up, he leaves, and everybody's happy. Hallelujah. Jesus healed this young kid, and it's all great. But there is a second miracle that takes place that actually happens before the first miracle. Okay? And does anybody know what the second miracle is? Don't show it up on the board. What is the second miracle? Anybody? What is it? Say it again. Healing, yeah, healed his son, but what's the second miracle? He regained his faith. The father regained his faith, right? So the second one is, and you see in verse 23, he says, if you can, right? And then verse 24 says, I believe, semicolon, help me overcome my unbelief. And the second miracle that takes place first, right, actually, is the father found his faith again, okay? Not that he lost his faith in God, but it's a weak faith. It's not an unbelieving, although that's the word that we use in the English. It's not the Greek word, okay? So he, he isn't that he loses his faith in God, but his faith is so weak that he doesn't believe that God can, and in that second miracle, which is really the first miracle, that, that, that come, he comes to terms with really his heart of the Father, okay? And, and so in your outline, and this is so important as we wrap up the series, sometimes mountains can move in unexpected ways. Sometimes we become so fixated on a particular mountain, a relational problem, a financial problem, a health issue, right? It's the big mountain in front of us. And that's all we see, and we're praying, God, move that mountain. But oftentimes in our life, God is at work moving another mountain, and we don't see it, right? And, and so in your outline, real quick, he oftentimes moves the mountain of fear, and we find peace even in the midst of chaos, right? Yeah. So you pray that the chaos ends, and it doesn't. Yet in the midst of it, you have peace, right? And it's a, it's a mountain that you weren't expecting because your prayer was, Lord, fix this chaotic situation. And God doesn't. But in the midst of it, you have peace. Second one is, oftentimes he moves the mountain of sorrow, and we find joy in the middle of pain, right? Right in the middle of pain. That person isn't healed, and perhaps that person does pass away, and that relationship isn't restored, and that child still will not talk to. And in the midst of it, God brings joy into your life, and the mountain that you prayed for, for it to happen, it doesn't move, but God does something completely different in your heart, and you didn't even see it coming. Right? He moves the mountain of despair and we find hope in the middle of darkness. Right? Again, oftentimes in the middle of that dark, dark time, we think, you know, Lord, I just want to see light. And yet it doesn't change. And yet in the midst of that, we find a tremendous amount of hope that takes place. And, and so we see in the Father's heart, eventually, right, in the second miracle, the Son is healed. But the first miracle is He is ambushed and He comes to terms with His heart issue that's going on, that He was wrestling with a faith issue. Doubt had creeped in because of the long period of time in which He waited, the times that He would watch His kid fall on the ground and go into convulsions, and He's wondering, God, when are you ever going to do something? And the longer you wait the more doubt creeps in, isn't it true? And you wonder, God, are you ever gonna move? Are you ever gonna move and take care of this situation? Look with me in your outline. <clears throat> there is something in your heart that, uh, is there something in your heart that Jesus healing, 
uh, healing power, right? And so this is a heart issue, just to kind of pause and take a step back. It may be that the mountain that Jesus really wants to move is inside of you, not the mountain that you're looking at in your life. So maybe it is a trust issue. In the midst of the situation that you're in, and you're relying on and looking for all these circumstances to change, maybe Jesus is calling you to just trust him in the midst of that. Just to relax and visualize yourself sitting in the hand of the creator. He's got you, right? Second one is, so let's do this again because you obviously don't know. When someone claps, that means that she agrees with it and then you all agree with her as well and then what do we do? All right. I'm going to hire a clapper. I am. It's the next staff position we're looking for. Second one is... Second one is, uh, will you put your faith in him? Right? Maybe some of you need to find your way back to God. And Christmas season is a great time. A lot of spiritual things happen in the lives of people where we come back to faith. The the third one is, will you let him work uh, a miracle in your heart? Will you allow him to do that? And then the last one, and this is where God just wanted me to hang out. Will you find forgiveness in your heart to forgive someone? You know what's interesting? Prayer and faith are the two most common connections, prayer and faith. Guess what the second one is with prayer? Forgiveness. Forgiveness, right? So prayer and faith are the very top. There's most, when you talk about prayer, there's always a faith component that's, that's mentioned in there. But the second one is the area of forgiveness, Right? That prayer is not only asking for forgiveness, but being willing to grant forgiveness to someone else. And again, we're, remember, we're looking at there's a mountain in front of us, but maybe God wants to do something in your heart. Maybe you were brought here today because there's somebody that you need to forgive in your heart. Let me throw a couple passages of scripture at you. Mark chapter 11, verse uh, 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask uh, for in prayer, believe that you have received it and, and it will be yours. In which case, everyone says, amen, and we're just going to stop right there, right? Let's read the passage. It goes on. And, so there's a connection. And when you stand praying, what's the next word? If you hold uh, anything against anyone, what's the next phrase? Forgive. Forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins, right? And oftentimes, I'll just be honest with you, I think sometimes the the thing that kills our prayer life is an unforgiving heart. Just the lack of desire to want to forgive someone for what they've done. And we'll get into it in a moment, but I know, but they didn't ask and they don't deserve it and all that other stuff. You know what? Nowhere in Scripture does it say that forgiveness is for them. Forgiveness is for you right? Regardless of what they say or do. How about this? How cool would this be? Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, so they came forward with their offering, uh, and there you remember your brother has something against you. Verse 24, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, And go and reconcile with your brother. See, sometimes when we take the offering and some of you bail, I'm thinking, that's it. You're going to go reconcile with your brother or sister in Christ. And then I find you at the restaurant and you beat all the rush in, right? So it wasn't about forgiveness. You just wanted to beat the other members of of the churches at whatever restaurant you're going to. I'm like, that ain't right. That's not what the verse says. It doesn't say leave early so you can get to the restaurant before everyone else shows up. (laughs) So imagine that. This is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is like, this is his most important message that he preached. And he says, when you bring an offering, if you recognize that there's something that you have against someone else, you you should just park it there. You turn to your neighbor and say, hey, will you drop this in the bag? I got to go.
go and you reconcile with them, right? See, that's the importance of forgiveness, and it doesn't matter if they deserve it. It doesn't matter if they somehow made amends with you. None of that is the issue. The issue is we forgive as he has forgiven us. And if you're struggling in your prayer life and a mountain isn't moving, I would ask you, take a step back in your spiritual life and ask, God, am I holding any grudge, bitterness, resentment, whatever it is, against someone else? And I just ask Holy Spirit, reveal it to me, right? And just ask him to forgive you. Now, let me say this on a side thing because some of you are like absolutely just like, oh. Forgiveness doesn't mean reconciliation in the relationship the way that it used to be. So oftentimes we'll hear that somebody has physically abused you, and it's like, if I forgive them, do I have to go hang out with them? No, right? Reconciliation and forgiveness are two separate conversations, okay? Reconciliation and forgiveness are two separate. So, so is forgiveness and hanging out together are two separate conversations, right? We are to forgive, period. Whether we hang out and restore the relationship like it once was is a whole other subject, and that has to do with trust in them and whether it's a safe environment, okay? And so some of you are just like, oh, I just can't do it. You know, you have to recognize it's not about rekindling the the relationship like it once was. You all with me on that? All right, back to Mark chapter 9, verse 27. So Jesus took him, the boy, by the hand, lifted him up to his feet, and what did he do? He stood up, right? So Jesus restores him back to his, his, his self. He's healed. The father's heart is healed, and the boy is healed. So both miracles take place, and there's this idea that his, his faith, the father's faith, begins to grow in it. So in your outline, faith, the core of the relationship. <clears throat> what Jesus desires most is our faith, all right? He longs for us to put our trust uh, in his goodness and his love. In fact, the Hebrew writer writes in Hebrews 11, verse 6, and without faith, what is it? impossible to please God because, uh, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly, what is it? Seek him, right? So then the question is, why is that? Why is faith such an important component in our, in our walk with, with God? Look with me in your outline. Think about this. The best relationships are built on faith and trust between two people. Okay, if you're, if you're here and you're thinking about getting married or you're married, let me just say this, that your faith in God and your spouse and your trust in your spouse is going to make your relationship either great or not. Okay, y'all got that? So if you do not have faith and trust in a relationship, your relationship's gonna always struggle right? It's always going to struggle. And so you have in your outline, you have a marriage. A marriage is solid when two, right? When the two know each other and they trust one another, okay? When you have full trust in your spouse that they have your best interest at heart and they are going to do what's best for you, and you have your best interest at heart for them, and you're going to do what's best for them, right? There's a mutual submission that takes place where each of you have the same goal, the same attitude, the same mindset, right? You have the two become one, and there is that connection. And when a relationship, in a, in a marriage relationship, when that happens, the relationship is really awesome, right? But when you don't trust your spouse, there's all kinds of problems. If you don't trust them financially, right, because of somebody being a poor steward of whatever it is, you think there's always going to be a problem? All the time, right? I got shredded credit cards in my office from couples, okay? Because someone couldn't trust their spouse, grinds it through, hands it to me and says, can you put it in your safe in your office? 
right? When you have a distrust, then the relationship's going to struggle. You all with me? Friendship. Think about your best friends. Do you have faith and trust in them? Sure. And the friendships that you have that maybe you consider to be really close, when they betray your trust, guess what? You distance yourself from them, don't you? Right? You're, you're just not that close to them because you don't trust them because they don't have your back. As in I say, whenever somebody says, hey, man, I got your back, don't trust them because <laughs> they don't have, if, if, you know, if you trust me, I don't need to tell you, right? Got that? <clears throat> All right, so how do we increase our faith? Romans chapter 10, we looked at this a couple weeks ago. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So in our doubts, in our doubts, when we begin our prayer, oh God, you created the heavens and earth, you're so powerful, you can transform the heart of that person, you can fix the relationship, you can heal cousin so-and-so, God, I believe that. And then all of a sudden, doubt kicks in. What do you do in that moment? Because this is going to be whether you grow in your faith or doubt stymies your faith and you just stop, okay? Too often, we stop when the doubt kicks in and we don't continue to to pray through and work through the situation, okay? And so when doubt kicks in, We do not stop there. We add in the word and. Okay, now let's go back to the father situation. The father struggled with his faith. The father didn't believe that Jesus was going to do that. His disciples couldn't. It was a last ditch effort. I mean, this was the last hope that he possibly had. And he exclaimed, I believe. And then all of a sudden, his brain caught up with what he just said. And he said, God, help me with my unbelief. Right? And in the midst of that struggle, he continued to pursue his walk. Right? And so in our situation, number one, and we are honest about our faith struggles. For far too long, Christians have been told, Christ followers have been told, if you question, if you doubt, if you struggle with your faith, there's something wrong with you. And the problem with that is that most of the disciples struggled with that. Most of the prophets of the Old Testament struggled with that. So if it was wrong for us, then it's wrong for them, and why are we reading what they wrote? Right, And so we see the struggle that takes place. And so in verse 24, he says, I believe. Oh no, what did I just commit to? Help me overcome my unbelief. And that doesn't mean that it means weak in faith is what that word means. All right. And so in your outline, real quick, base camp, which is uh, our, our uh, class that we have for folks who are getting reacquainted with Christ or coming to know Christ for the first time or just have lots of questions. And it's, a, it's an environment where it's relational and you can all questions are open and you can ask all the questions that you want. And so if you have a lot of questions about your faith, about the Bible, about God, about where did the dinosaurs go, you got all those questions, that would be a great opportunity for you to go and sign up for. On the back of the communication card, you just write base camp, and then on January 6th, here in a couple weeks, we'll be starting that, all right? Number two, the second thing is, and we act on the faith that we have, even though it may be as small as a mustard seed, right? You believe, oh, and I know God, but it's so small. I'm not so sure. Now, what did Jesus do to the Father? Did he honor his little tiny faith? Did he? Sure, he healed his heart and his kid, right? Now, when you think about that, when we we hear people say, you can never question God. It's like, really? Why not? I mean, you think God's going to like, his head's going to explode. It's like, oh, he's asking me questions. I can't handle it. Of course, he created us, right? He created us. You're going to struggle with it. And so we ask those questions, God, how come? It doesn't seem right. 
And, and so it's perfectly fine to do that. Jesus does not go to the Father, man, I cannot believe you. Do you know all the things that I've done? No, your kid isn't getting healed. Beat it. No, he doesn't. He heals his heart and his son. Now, the religious leaders Jesus was brutal on. Now, what's the difference between the father who has weak faith and the religious leaders? The religious leaders have fake faith, right? They don't have faith. They have religion. They have laws. They got God in a box. They got them figured out, right? The father is just wrestling with his struggles that he has in that moment when he's going through. Then the third thing is, and this is added in to, me, to, to, uh, to my thoughts, the other two words of fathers. Third one is, and we join a community group, group to strengthen our faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need to get in a community group. That wasn't very loud. Pa- Pastor Eric's not happy with you. <clears throat> He, he, here's why, here's why. I said it earlier. Spiritual growth and faith is not a one-man sport. Okay, it's not boxing. It's a team sport. It's a team sport, right? That, that you need folks around you that will encourage you in moments of weakness, in moments of doubt, in moments of questions, Right? And then you know what God's going to do? God's going to use you to encourage folks who are going through difficult times as well. Right? Now, now last week we talked about John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist was born at the exact time that he needed in order so that he could usher in Jesus. Right? Remember that for last week, right? And, and so Zachariah and Elizabeth, like 99, you know, years old, and they have a child because it was promised. And, and John the Baptist's number one thing that he was going to say is he's going to say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and Jesus is going to usher into his earthly ministry. Okay? Now, this is crazy. Do you know that John the Baptist doubted? I mean, think about that. This guy was born. See, they wanted a child. Elizabeth and Zechariah wanted a son. God wanted a prophet, right? And he was born to be a prophet. And as a prophet, there was a moment that he had doubt. You want to know what happened? He got arrested. He got put in jail. And he sends a letter to his, 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 his buddies that are ultimately going to go to Jesus. And here's the question. Will you do me a favor? Will you ask Jesus if he's really the Messiah? Is he the one? Because I'm full of doubt right now. I'm in jail. I'm not digging it too much. And you need to go to him and you need to ask him for some help. Right? So Luke chapter 7 verse 22. So he replied, Jesus replied to the messengers. This is John the Baptist's community group. You got it? All right. Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, and those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. So in a moment of doubt for John the Baptist, what did he have? He had two close friends that he can lean on, and he can say, hey, guys, I'm really struggling. Will you go to Jesus for me and just ask him this question? Is he really the right one? Is he the one that they promised was going to come? Is he really the Messiah? And his two buddies come back and report to him. And he says, hey, yeah, he's healing people. All all kinds of great things are happening. And so that is the value of community and community group, okay? That, That you have folks that you can wrestle with in your spiritual journey. Because again, whether you've been a believer for a long time and you consider yourself really spiritually mature or whether you are weak in faith, I can guarantee you there's going to be moments in your life where you're going to be in that place where you're questioning and you're doubting, right? Contrary to what you say, I'm very transparent. The more you understand scripture, 
the more questions that you have, and the questions that I have would scare you to death. Because there are all kinds of things that when you start harmonizing theological positions that you wrestle with, right? And so you're never, never, never over that time where you're not going to question and doubt God, okay? So if you do, welcome to the club. You're in the club with John the Baptist. Pretty cool, right? Let's pray. All right, now let's pray. So, Father, thank you that we as kind of flawed humans can just kind of wrestle with our faith. And you desire for us to kind of lean into you in those moments of doubt, to lean into other folks, believers' lives as well. And, Father, I just want to just kind of pause here for a moment and just my sensing of your spirit as I wrote the message and thought through the message that there's some hearts that you want to move mountains in, and it's connected to forgiveness. And Father, I just pray that your spirit would reveal to the folks who are here if there's folks that they need to forgive, a person that they need to forgive, an ex, a father, an uncle, a grandfather, grandmother, whatever it is, Lord, that you would enable them, empower them to forgive that person. Regardless of what they've said, done, asked for, none of that stuff's relevant. That, Lord, you would just release and dissolve that bitterness, that resentment, that hurt. Lord, that you would move that mountain that they didn't even expect to be moved. Father, as we move into the Christmas season, Lord, may we be reminded of who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah, that he's the King, that he's the Lord. And may we each be aware of our friends and neighbors who perhaps don't have that personal relationship, that we would be sensitive, that we would share the good news with them. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed as we wrap up today, Maybe you're here today, and God brought you here today to encourage you to find your way back to God, to move into a personal relationship with Him. And I want to give you that opportunity as we close. The ABCs, we just do it each week. A is admit that we're sinners, that we've all missed the mark. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that He died on a cross and that He rose again. And C is to confess Him, to be your Lord and Savior. And if you're here today and your desire is to find your way back to God, to enter into that personal relationship, just pray this prayer with me. Silently, just repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I have missed the mark. And I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And today I confess him to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Lord, thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said...